Hey there, cats and kitties. I am the Blues Man, Johnny Blues. Wanted to wrap with you guys live about two movies I finally got around to seeing and thoroughly, thoroughly had a blast watching. And I'm not going to get too, you know, into discussing them at length, uh, recapping or reviewing, uh, you know, in depth or anything like that. Just kind of wanting to shoot the breeze about them. Um, but both of these flicks, I, I left both of these flicks feeling like. This is what made me fall in love with movies when I was a kid. Uh, watching stuff like Batman 1989, Back to the Future, these grand in scope, sci-fi, fantasy, adventurous, humorous, down-to-earth and very compelling, uh, very dramatic in places kinds of movies in that grand, fantastical sandbox that is comic book culture. And, uh, or at least relating to it in the case of the formerly, uh, you know, aforementioned films. But, um, these, they just, I, I thoroughly had <laughs> my socks blown off by how much fun, how much, you know, vigor and, and, you know, sort of, uh, uh joie de vivre there was in, in these films, the, you know, how much vibrance there was and, and um, that's not to say, you know, I'm not going to get all wrapped up part and parcel with the anti-DC sort of thing, you know. I'm a fan of both DC and Marvel. I'm a fan of comics in general. They don't all have to be superheroes. I love Archie Comics. I love Conan the Barbarian and everything like that. Um, but I love DC and Marvel. Sometimes I lean a little more toward DC, but when Marvel's hitting it out of the park, I I'm going to come straight at you and tell you i loved these movies <laughs> you know homecoming and guardians of the galaxy volume 2 just thorough thorough blasts uh as far as you know comic book movies goes movies in general goes you know and uh both of these <laughs> films very intri intriguingly have sort of a twist involved relating around a father figure of sorts uh if you go to homecoming there is this sort of really, really, uh, you know, gravitas-laden sequence where the sort of, you know, pseudo-villain that is the Vulture, who's never actually named in the film. I've heard some people complaining that you don't actually get the name of the Vulture said, spoken, in any way, shape, or form in the film. Although you do get Shocker, two versions of him, by the way. Um, <laughs> you know, but um, you never get Vulture's name. But, you know, surrounding his character... Michael Keaton, man, uh, this guy was in top form in this film. There's rarely been a time where he hasn't been. Going back to Batman 89, as, as I mentioned, and, uh, you know, his comedic sort of performances before that, and, and you know, such like that. The film, uh, I can't recall the title of it off the top of my head. I did a, uh, you know... Wicked Flicks on, where he basically played the founder of, I think it's actually the founder of McDonald's, uh, was a fantastic, brilliant film, a brilliant performance by Michael Keaton. And, and this one, again, being able to go from such a renowned, beloved superhero in The Dark Knight in, in Batman to taking on a villainous role like the Vulture and doing so, I mean, it's one of those, you know, most compelling frameworks for a villain where it's very largely a relatable scenario. You know, he's having to sort of think three steps ahead as far as he can of how he's going to maintain a lifestyle, a living condition for his family, his wife and daughter, whom he loves dearly. How is he going to make a life for them? In a world where superheroes exist and he's just had the carpet ripped out from under him in this cleanup job and everything like that. And, and so he is not out and out sympathetic, but, you know, you can kind of understand where he's coming from. You can, to a point, relate to that. If you've ever lost a job to someone else or to automation or whatever it is, you know, if you're empathic even remotely and, and you could sort of put yourself in this man's place... Where is he going to get the money to keep the food on the table? And so, because he's been, for all intents and purposes, dicked by the man, by the government, by the superheroes, the the tights-wearing, flamboyant characters that are out there, you know, summoning aliens through portals and wiping uh, devastation across the city like, oh, oh, so many pine trees from Bob Ross, you know. Um, uh, what's his reaction going to be? And he kind of comes at it from a very practical, pragmatic 
but no less criminal venture, uh, criminal enterprise sort of mentality of stealing stuff and selling it, and and also sort of uh, you know you know backwards configuring it and creating new kinds of weapons and this that and the other thing, the alien technology and whatever like that. So I found his character to be very compelling. Uh, Tom Holland also knocked it out of the park as Peter Parker and Spider-Man. Um, a very, you know, in his infancy stages, Spider-Man, I might add. He, you know, he hasn't been around the block yet. And uh, he's very much going through that tutorial pedagogue phase of, of you know, uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man and, and Tony Stark and whatever like that. And uh, I love that we got John Favreau back as happy. I love that we saw uh, Gwyneth Paltrow in the end as well as Pepper Potts. And um, I like that it was a sort of coming of age thing. Uh, it's gotten a lot of, you know, sort of praise for its homaging John Hughes and specifically Ferris Bueller's Day Off and such like that. And uh, as a big time fan of some of, not all, of John Hughes films, you know, I, I definitely liked that. I loved that Ferris Bueller reference. It's one of my favorite of his films. And uh, it's happening as it's also on screen. Uh, you know, the homage is happening as the film is very literally being showcased on a plasma or whatever it is in, in the LCD screens, you know, in the background. And uh, it just, I, I really thoroughly had a blast. I loved, uh, you know, I've had a crush on Marissa Tomei for a very long time, going back to my cousin Vinny. And uh, she nailed it out of the park as Aunt May, although I think underutilized would be a fair assessment. I, I don't think we got enough of her in the film, at least for me. Um, but that ending though, <laughs> you know, Pete's got his spidey suit on. He takes off the mask and there she is looking in the doorway. What the, f and then the music kicks in, um, you know, such like that. I mean, I, I loved it. I, I loved the Stanley cameo and everything like that. It was a blast. Uh, all the ladies in Peter Parker's life are gorgeous, uh, you know, <laughs> from sort of the nerdy chick to the popular Babrini chick to the even the, the chick on the news, uh, who I think is one that later shows up in the Daily Bugle. Uh, if you go back to, like, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man or something, I think I saw that somewhere. Um, I don't remember all the characters' names. And even his buddy, uh, you know, Pete's buddy in, in the film, finding out and then being able to very much literally become that most oft dreamed role uh you know for for peter the guy in the chair on the computers you know hacking and then telling him where to go and all that stuff he got to live the dream man and then he also saved peter's life at one point so that was cool um all in all i was left bouncing off the walls by this film and, and same goes for guardians volume two uh i loved of course the first Guardians, and it's always felt kind of like a niche within a niche, in a sense, because not many people really know, or, you know, at least before the first Guardians film, got what Guardians was, and such like that. Even I myself, I wasn't largely familiar with them, if familiar with them at all. And um, fell in love with the characters in the first one. And, man, this one, I, I would dare to say this film is even better than the first. Uh, all the returning characters, I, I like the arcs revolving around Nebula and, and Yondu and everything. Oh, man, Yondu. <laughs> God damn, Yondu. Oh, man, I, I was thoroughly, thoroughly bummed out by the end of the film. Uh, his, his, I'll say act, I don't want to spoil it outright in case you haven't seen the film. Um, but what he does... And this coming on the coattails of the realization of, of Star-Lord Peter Quill himself in that grand sort of divide that is my biological father versus my dad. Um, this is something I could highly relate to because I have a biological father who's a scumbag and, and a prick and a monster and I want nothing to do with. Uh, and uh, But I was raised by my dad, who is sadly no longer with us. Neither my mom or dad are. But um, So I could really kind of relate to that, you know, that whole plight of Star-Lords that his parents are no longer with them. And uh, how much he still carries that weight with him. That, you know, missing them and mourning them so many years on. And uh, being daring, arguably, because of that sense of loss and trying to get close to Gamora and everything. And uh, I love all the bickering, 
know, Batista, man, Drax constantly had me cracking up. Um, I wasn't laughing as much with Rocket, but I love Rocket. Rocket was thoroughly, whereas he was like this great, fun, comedic character in, in the first movie. I, I mean, there was so much more depth to the raccoon in the group. <laughs> in this movie, uh, between him and Yondu, especially when they both lay it all out on the line and they're like, we're the same, you know, that whole sequence, uh, that whole sequence where they're, you know, the, the, I forget what they're called, uh, Reavers or whatever they are, capture them and, and imprison them. And they got a little group running around, <laughs> he comes back with a mechanical eyeball and a, you know, a toe and a desk or a table or something. <laughs> and Yondu just wants the mohawk, you know. Um, and that whole thing, Groot was a delight. I love the angsty teenage Groot by the end as well. If you stayed post credits for those, what was it like, five or six post credits uh, scenes and whatever. Um, but that whole dynamic, that whole scene where they're breaking out, they're jailbreaking, kind of sort of, and they're killing everybody left, right, and center. I got to tell you, that scene. The song that plays, the Jay and the Americans song that plays during that sequence is a song I have been trying to track down for like a decade. Um, one of my all-time favorite songs is Karamiya by Jay and the Americans. And this song, uh, in, in particular, in that sequence, you know, I, I remembered the scenario that is sung about in in the song you know a guy sidles up to a chick in a club or whatever like that he knows she has a big bad boyfriend and that big bad boyfriend's coming along and but i couldn't remember for the life of me the lyrics the only thing i could remember was that was specifically sang in the song was that the guy runs out the window by the end of it and i was kind of like well it's kind of like you know big bad leroy brown uh sort of kind of sort of it's like that uh, with Little Darlin', the doo-wop song from the 60s, and, and like, I I couldn't find it. I couldn't find the song for upwards of 10 years, maybe longer, probably longer. And uh, it was an oldies song that takes me back. A lot of the soundtrack from the first movie and the second movie very much harkens back to me, my relationship and, and the passion for music that I got, uh, you know, that was passed down to me by my mom and dad, who were products of, uh, of that era, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and um, from the hard rock to the heavy metal to the to the pop and everything like that, and uh, so all of the music was already affecting me, <laughs> you know, and so here is this song I've been looking for that immediately directs me back to, you know, remembrances of my mom specifically, because she was into the 50s, 60s doo-wop resurgence and stuff like that, Frankie Valli and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I love that stuff. So um, to hear that song and like by the second verse, by the first verse, I'm like, oh, I've heard this song before. I've heard all of them before almost. But, you know, <laughs> this song in particular, second verse comes along and I'm like, this, holy, this is the one I've been looking for for like over a decade, you know. And uh, so I was really ecstatic about that. And uh, as I say, the father figure scenario my father versus my dad and you know the bantering and the back and forth and all the gold people uh you know i'm not, I'm not really in depth familiar with all the comic based characters that all these characters are based on and everything like that and i couldn't tell you what all their names were i loved mantis i loved gamora i loved drax i loved the, the mains uh nebula kind of sort of making amends with gamora you know that sisterly amends and uh, you know um but man <laughs> I was so bummed by the end. I was thinking, too, you know, with Ego, there was a lot of speculation. Are we going to actually have Ego being the living planet? But then there's Kurt Russell, and that whole de-aging thing at the beginning of the film gobsmacked me. It was the best de-aging I've seen probably anywhere in any movie, uh, you know, to date. The younger Kurt Russell has young Ego, you know, wooing uh, Star-Lord's mother and everything. Uh, in, in 1980, I guess it was. Um, but, like, his whole thing, when when finally that, like, final confrontation happens and you have all that glowing light that, you know, you see the big giant ego face and everything like that, I'm like, 
wow, I, I love this even that much more than when we saw this same character in Star Trek V, <laughs> The Final Frontier. What does God need with a starship? You know, and uh, well, apparently he's looking for his son. That's what he was doing when the Enterprise happened upon heaven and, and God and whatever in Star Trek V. If you've never seen that film, it's going right over your head, this reference. Um, <laughs> you know, but and if you haven't, go check it out. It's it's not that great, but you'll get what I'm getting at. Um, so, yeah, all the all the actors in, in this film, all the performances were stellar. Uh, was really surprised. I did not know Stallone was going to be in this and uh, haven't seen anything of his in years. Uh, you know, no Expendables, nothing like that. I haven't seen Creed yet or anything like that. Um, and it's been a long time since I've seen any of the Rocky films or anything, you know, uh, such like that. So, I mean, he came out of nowhere, <laughs> you know, and I like what I've seen in videos uh, discussed since having seen the films that, you know, basically uh, when by the end, uh, when everything is said and done, one of those sort of final post credits scenes is dealing with some of the original Guardians members from the comics. I didn't know that at the time, and I have that much more depth and appreciation for it, knowing that James Gunn put that in there, uh, you know. But uh, just really wanted to share with you guys that I loved both of these flicks. I had a blast watching both of these flicks. Same with Wonder Woman. I, I finally got around to that a few weeks ago, and uh, it was fantastic. These two movies, as far as I'm concerned, I have little to no complaints whatsoever. I, I was thoroughly engaged from the word go, and and it was like I was hit with a whirlwind and, and left both of them just gobsmacked and, and grinning and like, oh man, this was th these were fantastic movies. This is what I love about movies. Make pretend, you know, and that kind of thing. Comic books, comic book movies, all that stuff. And uh, so I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments below. If you've listened to this rambling, incoherent <laughs> discussion video of these two movies, Spider-Man Homecoming and, and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, what you thought of them. If you loved them, if you had any gripes, if you had any complaints, you know, post it in the comments below. Uh, you know, love it or hate it, anything goes. As long as we have a great conversation, that's what this is all about. And so, yeah. Otherwise, it'll be pretty much for me on this. Hope this video finds you well. <laughs> and I'll catch you all later. Peace.